Hello, everybody. It's really great to see everyone here. We have an incredible roundtable for all of us today, and we're going to be focusing on uh, technology and uh, uh, how technology affected our Exciting times as we are approaching uh, the time where a lot of people are now able to get the vaccines, and a lot of uh, organizations are bringing start beginning to bring people back into the office, which actually spells another big change, another big motivator in this world. And uh, again, something new for us all to experience: these hybrid workplaces, uh, people working much more um, all over the world, but also. Uh, working in person. So a lot of change happening on that front as well. And with that, I want to introduce our panel who are um, a blend of experts uh, across um, uh, computer science and digital expertise and life sciences. And without further ado, I will let uh, our members introduce themselves. So um, Maybe uh, we'll start with, uh, I will just uh, look at, at my screen here. Maybe we start with uh, Chris here. Chris, wait. Sure. Thank you. Uh, um, I uh, have spent 30 years in the life sciences biopharma sector, uh, mostly on the operating side. And now I run an accelerator or company incubator seed fund uh, supporting early stage life science companies, entrepreneurs, scientific founders. I also run a venture fund that does Series A investments, uh, again, mostly across therapeutics, uh, drug technologies, uh, devices, uh, some diagnostics, and health tech. Thank you. Um, really, really excited to have you here. Era, do you want to go next? Um. Sure. Uh, thank you, Lilian. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sara Brutzan. I'm the head of digital innovation at Sustainalytics, which is an ESG research and ratings house. Uh, I've been spent the past decade on focusing on how, uh, focusing on the application of artificial intelligence, machine learning, data intensive digital curation, ontological analysis, open source intelligence to environmental, social and governance data and information identification, retrieval and inside generation. And that's going to be my focus during today's talk. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Manish? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Manish Katari. I'm the president of SRI International, which is a large research nonprofit uh, out in Menlo Park. You've probably heard about, not heard of us, but you may have heard of some of our products. So if you use Siri in your iPhone, that came from us. If you've done intuitive surgical for surgical robotics, that came from us. And Nuance Communications, which was a big early voice group, also came out of our group. My background is both in health tech image processing as well as, uh, at this point, robotics and AI and the uses of things like AR, VR, and advanced technologies uh, in for new applications. Fantastic. Thank you, Manish. And Pam, uh, can you introduce yourself, please? Um, thank you. I'm Pam Rantava, uh, founder and CEO of Empirical. Empirical is an early stage biotech company. Uh, we're focused both actually on therapeutics and uh, diagnostics. Uh, we've developed a, a biomimetic platform, which includes the, um, you know, chemical catalyst and biological processes and computational models to accelerate uh, drug discovery and development. And uh, we're focused currently on antiviral therapeutics, uh, looking at the existing drugs that are highly toxic and how we make them better. Um, and we are also developing a of diagnostics. Uh, it's, it's a major platform. Um, almost the entire lab uh, will be at home to look at the therapeutic response, uh, early disease detection, drug-drug interaction, uh, disease severity, regression, and progression. Um, I have spent most of almost entire career in the healthcare space. I worked in 
then you were starting from policy to developing uh, digital technologies and the predictive modeling simulation, AI-based, to, um, to the drug safety and clinical trials and now drug discovery. Um, so I, I've sort of covered that spectrum in the last 20 years. Um, I serve on the board of Mass Life Science Center, which is the uh, state of Massachusetts one uh, $1.6 billion fund uh, for life sciences innovation and, and creating jobs. I also serve on the board on MassBio, which is our industry association with Chris. And, um, you know, pleasure to be here. And I'm looking for this uh, discussion. Thank you so much. And I have to say, I'm so excited to have met all of you and uh, uh, about the conversation that we're going to have for the next hour in my role at Microsoft, I focus mostly on technology um, and especially on innovation that's happening out there in different segments. Um, and um, I'm just really looking forward to this conversation. I want to start us by talking about um, some of the gaps and uh, weaknesses, but also the flip side of that, the strength that got exposed throughout the last last uh, year in terms of public health, in terms of biology, but also the technology and how technology has really influenced that. So a little bit of reflection, both from the biological side, but also from the technological side. So I would love to hear from all of you on this topic. And Pam, since uh, uh, since you uh, your expertise in this area, maybe you can start. Um, and, and we can start with biology and then maybe go to Chris and, and, and hear from the, from the more technical side. Well, thank you. Um, you know, COVID-19 uh, really tests the limits of our public health structure uh, across the world, anywhere from, you know, developed countries to uh, low to middle income countries. I think uh, across the board, we all face the challenges, uh, both from a public health and healthcare delivery side of it, uh, healthcare management, as well as on the technology side. And, you know, I feel very proud that our technology, uh, our industry really stepped up. Uh, you know, we had a record time vaccines that were developed. We, um, you know, we had some bumps on, on, on the diagnostic side, but we were able to scale them and, and get them there. We still have a long way to go. On the digital side, uh, you know, telemedicine became very prominent. And, uh, you know, obviously we do have a lot of challenges still because, you know, we ended up uh, going in the direction of, of focusing on COVID, but many of the other healthcare needs were sort of, you know, sort of got put on the back burner. Um, so, you know, from a technology's perspective, you know, you know, new platforms for vaccines uh, got, got, got into play. And those are the mRNA vaccines. We have three already in the market and more coming. Um, and so that's remarkable. I mean, that was, you know, successful because there was a great collaboration across the world, um, you know, with, with these uh, companies that in the past, they may Chris, not. Are you able heard. to hear me? Um, I've lost Pam. Are you able to hear Pam? Yeah, I, I was able to hear Pam. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, it's not coming through for me. Um, should I? Pam, do you want to finish? I'll go. Yeah. Oh, sorry, um, I apologize. I can't see you. Okay. No, go no ahead and, uh, Chris, if you can let me know when that's. You, uh, you, when you can read my list. Just go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so so I think I think the the technologies in in, in the vaccine side, um, you know, we have some high throughput, uh, you know, technologies were used for uh, looking at the existing compounds for therapeutic side. Um, and then on the diagnostic side, we've been, you know, looking at all different types of technologies. You know, PCR was long gone, but, you know, on the CRISPR side, uh, CRISPR-Cas13 has been um, uh, also been used for uh, point of care devices, uh, point of care testing, and, and which has more advantage over, you know, the cost and the usability and, and, and so forth. So I think that from, uh, you know, vaccines, the therapeutics, to digital health, there has been innovation all, all across. Yes, I'll go next. Uh, I think Pam covered it well um, in that uh, if you look at it from a vaccine and therapeutic standpoint, I think we, uh, the industry gets good marks. Um, uh, on the vaccine particularly, we had some therapeutics also that were uh, advanced quickly through development. Uh, some antibodies, uh, remdesivir, oral small molecule. I think if you look back, though, on how we managed COVID in the United States, um, it really exposed, uh, you know, some unpreparedness 
uh, and the policy kind of had to, uh, you know, be accelerated before the data was really there to understand, uh, you know, the, you know, how the diagnostics were rolling out. Uh, there was a lot of talk about contact tracing that didn't really play out. There was issues related to, you know, state policies that varied, um, and even back and forth in terms of what is the right public policy stance, whether it be, you know, via restricting travel, um, you know, uh, the distancing, what should we allow for meetings? Um, and this varied. It varied month to month sometimes and state to state. Um, and and so I think there have been a lot of learnings of what we could do better. Uh, I don't think it's related to the industry. In some ways, uh, many people felt that the drug and vaccine industry, uh, you know, would be caught flat footed in a situation like this and uh, that we needed to invest, you know, billions or, you know, uh, uh, hundreds of billions into preparing to mobilize quickly. And I think if anything, our industry showed that we can move very quickly. And within a year, the regulatory uh, agencies uh, really stepped up as well. So I think from a um, delivering a solution, there's very high marks. But in terms of uh, being prepared with diagnostics, effective diagnostics, uh, uh, you know, that are easy to deploy, uh, being prepared for what is the right public policy stance and how do we roll that out, you know, more nationally. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot I think that we can learn uh, about, you know, doing a better job if the next you know, a viral pandemic strain that we haven't seen before, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, hits, hits the United States again. So uh, that would be my, my perspective on, um, you know, what we can learn from this past year. Thank you so much, Chris. And I think you're right. You know, the, the, where we are struggling is actually in logistics and uh, synchronization and uh, being able to, to get through delivery of these vaccines, especially now we're seeing that quite a bit. And, but, but even when we were originally spinning up testing, um, I have to apologize. I don't see some of you at this point. So Chris F, uh, you may need to help me MC because I see you just fine. So I was hoping that we can go to Ari next and talk a little bit more about the, how the technology supported that because of, the digital act has enabled a lot of biosciences, uh, but also uh, a huge change has happened last year in terms of accelerating uh, to technical development as well. So, um, Ari, over to you. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think what uh, from the uh, from where I sit, and uh, I work for the sustainability research and rating industry, sustainability is part of Morningstar. It became, became part of Morningstar last year. We noticed that pandemic actually focused a lot of attention to the foundational fragilities of the humankind, things that had been known before but hadn't probably struck us uh, so hard as during the pandemic. So climate change being one example. You know, everything is linked to everything else in the world. But uh, we've seen uh, over the past 12 months that uh, th uh, for if I take in particular climate change or uh, you know the carbon for global carbon footprint pandemic helped see precisely in a way how these uh, things affect our economy affect our livelihoods and uh, what I've seen as a head of smart technology or advanced technology at sustainable was that interestingly information and insights that in the pre-pandemic world would be attainable technologically on the first level, so to say, right? So you would go to, you would use machine learning to go to analyze uh, corporate disclosure for carbon footprint or for uh, for corporate um, performance with regards to climate change. What we've noticed is that uh, there was a move towards a second order information emergence. What I mean under this is that information related to climate change mainly emer emerges as the result of a second order observation. When you mesh together with the help of artificial intelligence or machine learning, corporate disclosure with satellite imagery, with regulator insights, and when you apply on the top of this new and dynamically developing uh, ontologies, suddenly the important insights that then we use for our research rating uh, for that 
our client base, mainly responsible investors use, the main insights appear as an emergent property of applying artificial intelligence and machine learning to uh, different types of data. So I would say that probably, at least for the first time in my experience, main and most valuable data as, uh, appears when AI or ML aren't used as auxiliary technologies for information retrieval or acquisition or processing, but as an environment that generates insights as emergent properties. So on the highest level, that's what I put it. And that brings a lot of new challenges for technologies. You know, that theme that seemed to be somehow forgotten in AI for this or that reason, meaning ontological analysis, ontological engineering started to take momentum again and again over the past uh, 12 months. I'd say that this is the first thing that has uh, that strikes me immediately when I think about the big change, is the transition from the first to the second order of observation and what ML or AI, what role they play as an environment, not as a toolkit during this transition. Very interesting. You're also talking about predictive capabilities of AI. Um, we've seen uh, some of the earliest uh, samples that were coming in from Europe um, that were uh, gen genetically typed and uh, trying to understand how different people are reacting depending on, on their genotype and phenotype um, to, uh, to the original COVID uh, strain. Um, we learned a lot uh, in terms of understanding how the virus actually affects uh, individuals and that uh, that definitely uh, helped with the uh, development of vaccines as well as um, accelerated um, uh, uh, drug discoveries. Manish, uh, um, how do you, how have you seen this uh, evolve over the past year? Um, what, what are some insights that you can share with us? Sure. So it's definitely been an extraordinary last 12, 15 months. And I would say that one of the things that really became interesting is how we realized the fragility of the plumbing side, if you will, to adopt these new technologies. I mean, the simplest examples being, you know, do we have enough broadband everywhere so students who can't go in can work off of a video feed? And the answer we found out is we don't. Uh, there was huge swaths of this country which did not have that access. So, you know, way while, I mean, of course it was a huge negative, but thinking into the future and thinking about this is two things that happened. One is there was a recognition early during this crisis that that sort of plumbing needs to be augmented and strengthened. And, and I think it is actually happening now. I mean, it would have been great if it happened 12 months ago, but it is happening now. And that is actually a, a pretty significant long-term change in this, in not in this country and in the world. I think the second change is a, a behavioral change, which I can tell you, I mean, in med medicine, even for all of the technological advancements that there are, there's a lot of resistance amongst the operators of day-to-day -day medicine uh, on adopting new technologies. And they, there's a lot of resistance, often with good reason, to be clear. Uh, often they will look at the new technology and say, this doesn't help us. It doesn't completely understand the nuances of what we do. But this last 12 months has really opened uh, their eyes to the fact that we do need to adopt new technology on a relatively quick basis in certain circumstances. And that is a behavior change that shouldn't be underestimated. I, I think that we're going to see far more rapid adoption of new techniques and technologies in healthcare and other places. But let's just use healthcare as a, as a space. We will see a lot more adop adoption in, in all of these areas faster because people are more open to it now than they were even 12 or 15 months ago. Yeah, I, I, I really reflect on what you're saying and maybe you can um, expand a little bit on um, uh, how are you seeing this evolving this year, especially as people starting to travel, they're starting to come back to, to the office. At the same time, others are going to remain uh, in homes. And uh, as we kind of close the last year and start on this next phase of the journey, are you seeing particular technologies emerge that are going to, uh, going to be helpful here? Yeah, I mean, let's use an example from healthcare, right? So, you know, let's let's start with a, a, a shocking fact, right? So, how many times is a surgeon tested 
after they finish their residency? And the simple answer is exactly zero times. Uh, they are never tested for, uh, yet they're taking on new implants and new techniques to adopt. What they used to do is once a year, go to a cadaver lab with everybody else, do the, do the training under supervision with somebody who was knowledgeable. And I've done this early in my career as well, being that person. And then you go back out and six months later, you may have your first case. This lack, this training deficit is more problematic than one thinks. Today, if you ask a surgeon that, a year ago, if you asked a surgeon, would you just put on a pair of VR goggles and we can walk you through the training? The answer would have been no. The answer would have been, I'm not sure, I can't feel the tissue, I can't sense the tissue. I, there's a lot of reasons why it's not a perfect technology. Today, if you ask a surgeon, they'll go, absolutely, yes. Let me put those goggles on. Let me work through the procedure. Actually, great. I know what I have to do in these steps and this. Yes, I didn't get the perfect cadaver example, and I'm not saying that you don't want to do that as well. But A, you don't need to travel somewhere. B, you can actually do a refresher the day before your first uh, case with that new new set rather than a test you did six months ago. So for all these reasons, this is actually a very fundamental improvement that's that's taken place. And it's possible because of the advances in virtual reality and other methods to use things. Has virtual, virtual reality was already developing in this direction over the last 36, 48 months. This last 12 months has actually accelerated its use in cases such as training considerably. Yeah, we see it as well, uh, especially when the first uh, pandemic stroke uh, in the universities, actually, and in medical schools, uh, students all of a sudden didn't have the ability to, to work anymore. So um, uh, AR, VR really started, uh, started to step up to help them. Um, both work with uh, virtual virtual patients as well as just remote patients, so being able to see through another doctor's eyes and and and, and learn that way. Um, Chris, Pam, how are you seeing that from from your point of view? Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll start. I, I think that one thing that is a positive byproduct of you know COVID lasting so long and us having a year to adjust in terms of um, how we work um, is that we've kind of all proved that we can work with remote based teams uh, that we don't have to y adhere to the same, you know, kind of, uh, you know, structure of a central location that everybody has to convene and check in at, you know, 830 AM and depart at 530 PM. And I think that has lent, you know, a efficiency and a challenge to be able to think uh, how you can work smarter. And the way this would apply to the healthcare arena is that, you know, for, for many years, people were questioning whether there was a more efficient way than to have everybody, you know, drive to a clinic or present at a hospital or go to the emergency room if they had, you know, something wrong. And I think while telemedicine was uh, here, uh, this really accelerated it. And I remember uh, listening to the CEO of Brigham and Women's, one of our you know uh, largest hospitals uh, in the Boston area. And they went from, I think, 15 telemedicine visits uh, in the first week of March uh, to like 3,000 in the second week of March. And you know, now that we've had a year of understanding and learning how to do remote-based you know, care, diagnostics, uh, and it has accelerated both investment and companies that are accelerating their technologies to move a lot of diagnosis, uh, care, and all of that to the home and to kind of uh, manage as much as you can remotely because many for a long time felt that, you know, hospitals were these, you know, centers of risk, of infection, of you know, and a lot of uh, resistant pathogens that are there. Um, and, you know, we, we know this uh, particularly now from, you know, the healthcare workers who are on the front lines and how much they're exposed to. So if there are ways that we can uh, provide better healthcare delivery uh, and reduce the risks unintended of patients, you know, uh, getting sick by having to go to central places where there are other sick people, 
this will really help us uh, for the future of medicine. Thank you, Chris. Pam, how are you seeing it evolving? And um, sounds like we are actually um, driving a lot of adoption of technologies that were available before. Are you seeing things that are dramatically different, new technologies that are evolving, new methodologies that are coming because of uh, of pandemic? Yeah, you know, to build on what Manish and Chris both said, um, you know, from a uh, public health delivery perspective, uh, we're going to see more and more, uh, not only just the adoption of telemedicine and point of care diagnostics, but we're also going to see uh, the uh, triaging of 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 care that where people, those who don't need that, you know, hospitalization or office visit they can be at home, you know, tests can be performed at home and uh, a, a physician visit can be virtually done. Uh, data analytics can be performed and, and that can be very effective. Um, I think the other area uh, would be um, really making sure that it's, uh, you know, since this will be all digital type of technologies, there's a lot more adoption, um, is that how we actually can make sure that this is this doesn't continue as an episodic care, um, that it's more integrated care, because we will have still large percentage of people, you know, just using these virtual visits and and they will be remote and so forth. So that's going to become very uh, prominent, I think. And I think COVID kind of pushed it because COVID was one of those, you know, uh, infections that attacked everything on your on your system, um, you know. Anywhere from looking at the pulmonary system to thrombotic events to inflammation and, you know, having multi-organ failures in a severe cases. So you can't just look at, you know, an isolation, a disease. This is really required you to look at across the board. So another thing also that I'm a little bit disappointed about um, that we haven't as, as, a, as an industry made, uh, you know, progress is that we did not release even to this day what is the treatment protocol? The day you're diagnosed, what is the treatment protocol? At every stage of this disease, what should doctor do? So the reason we had a lot of deaths and you know severity in the disease early on was because we told people to stay home and just isolate yourself and you know and 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 if you feel you know have certain type of symptoms then call. But what happened by the time they had those symptoms, it was too late. So I think that to me is still missing to this day. That has to happen. Um, and, and, but the overall, you know, the solutions, I've been impressed how companies have come along, you know, in terms of scaling. Um, I'm also happy, and I think it more needs to happen, uh, reimbursement models. I mean, for years, CMS in the U US, you know, dragged their feet in terms of reimbursing for telemedicine. We had like, handful of companies really working hard and they raise a lot of money to to survive. Uh, but all of a sudden in the last year, we saw, you know, more and more codes that were released by, uh, you know, CMS to pay for it. And insurance companies also jumped on the bandwagon. Um, same thing happened on the point of care devices. I mean, it took over a decade for a company to get reimbursement for INR. For the longest time, we didn't have other anticoagulants and they were using warfarin. Warfarin INR needed to be measured more frequently to understand that, you know, patient was in that narrow therapeutic window that the, the dosing was appropriate. And I think those are the examples that we had them before as a status quo. COVID really changed that. So I think there has been a lot of positive from that perspective. So I think one of the key is going to be for all of these technologies, whether they are in therapeutics, whether they are, you know, in diagnostics, vaccines, uh, digital health, is the scalability. Can we bring the affordable, you know, access to these, these solutions so really we can scale them and have the most efficient care possible? Thank you, Pam. I think your your point about uh, bringing the care to the patient, about empowering the patient to actually have the continuity of care, because even with the um, digital care today, with the telecare, it's still each individual provider, and then there's this continuity between them. Uh, and then most importantly, Gail in the audience is, uh, um, is mentioning is closing the gaps in care. Uh, who is able to get it from 
the availability of the digital equipment or networks all the way to obviously insurance and, and uh, ability to actually get care. Um, Ara, do you uh, do you have a point of view on uh, um, on how technology may evolve in the next year or two to continue to close this gap and uh, and to support that? What what are you seeing coming in the next couple of years? I wish I had a good understanding of that. I would probably end up in the Forbes list, but at least I say I probably. Uh, from our the perspective of the business that I'm in, sustainability analysis, what we've seen and the big trend that we've been seeing technology-wise is, you know, uh, smart technology, AI, machine learning, natural language generation has really become ubiquitous over the past year or something. Somebody once said that the moment you can put your finger at it, it's not AI anymore. And we've seen that you know, again and happening again and again. I think that uh, the knowledge acquisition and knowledge uh, business in itself has gone through a um, period of commodification of smart technology. And that has brought, has posed a big challenge. And if it's a challenge for us, I'm certain it's a challenge for, for, uh, for the intersection of health and technology. And that, this challenge is the following. So Seattle biases and you know, our individual biases are frozen in a way in technology through whatever, let's say, training sets, through the way technology is being built. And with AI especially, you know, once you've built it without thinking about the biases, without thinking what kind of ideologies or what kind of, I'm using this uh, term neutrally, are frozen into this technology. It's very hard to reverse engineer that. So one thing that I'm very conscious of and my team and my colleagues have been thinking a lot about is how to embed uh, a ethics into AI or how to approach uh, the former Ontario Privacy Commissioner Anne Kavukian called it AI ethics by design. So she came up with some principles and these principles are nothing new uh, because, in a way, they entail into themselves explainable AI or interpretable AI. What I'm trying to convey is that I increasingly see that explainable AI or that embedding ethics into AI is becoming more and more important, let's say, in the investment analysis or sustainability analysis business. I can only imagine how much more important it, uh, it is relatively in, in healthcare. And principles like transparency and accountability of algorithms or ensuring that ethical principles apply to the, uh, to the treatment of personal data or algorithmic oversight and responsibility to be assured, for example, uh, data protection, documentation to facilitate ethical design and symmetry of artificial intelligence modules. I think these are not nice to have anymore. These are musts. And if any business that deals with data that touch people and any business by definition does, if they don't do that today, they will be paying a price in two to three years time. So to wrap it up, Lila, I'm not sure where technology goes, but I'm sure that if it doesn't go down the path of embedding ethical considerations into uh, smart technology, into advanced technology, those businesses will, are going to be paying high operational, transactional, or societal fee for that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And uh, uh, at least from, from my point of view, we've developed this uh, um, uh, ethical principles as uh, as our engineers build uh, AI. And, you know, some examples of that is, making sure there is no harm in the decision making uh, of this autom automation because uh, uh, even analysis of how algorithms impacts individual uh, customer or individual uh, individual patient sometimes is not performed so it's really critical that um, engineers all the way down to an individual are thinking about these outcomes and thinking about how their work is going to impact uh, impact people. I think what we've seen in the last uh, year or two is that different people weren't uh, affected the same way. So we've seen, you know, uh, African Americans being, um, been affected much more drastically by the, by the virus with much worse uh, outcomes. So 
ensuring we're also, and this is where uh, intelligence, maybe not AI, but just analytics actually can help us understand why certain things are happening in our, in our society and how we can counter, uh, counter them. Um, especially as we as we move forward into the next into the next phase, um, I just want to um, open this up a little bit for discussion for people to uh, to speak up how you're thinking about um, transforming both technology and healthcare to become more equitable to catch this ethical issue ethical issues and then to move it into the right direction. Thoughts? You know, one of the things that I uh, think about a lot is. Um, we talked a lot about in the in the developed world, right, uh, how we have those infrastructures and we can have the connectivity and we can mobilize in the case of vaccines that required, you know, cold chain distribution in freezing temperatures. Uh, you know, it's not easy, but it's more manageable when you're talking about, you know, United States, Europe, right, more uh, uh, advanced centers. Uh, when you think about how technology uh, writ large has proliferated throughout the entire world, including the developing world, right? Uh, there's a lot of information that we can access now that, you know, anywhere in the world people can access. And I think you're going to see in the next, you know, 10 years or so as the price of, you know, genetic information uh, goes down and is more easy to capture as we start to see, you know, our smartphones capture a lot of our health information. As we see telemedicine, where you can capture uh, data from patients uh, remotely, as people can potentially use wearable, you know, devices to get, you know, like Apple Watch or something, uh, or something similar to that to capture basal, uh, you know, function, whether it's, uh, you know, lung function or heart uh, monitoring or brain wave monitoring. Uh, I think all of these technologies will give us a tremendous amount of information, uh, even in remote areas around the world. The challenge comes in when you realize somebody could benefit from an intervention and how do you get that intervention to the person? And I think that's where, I mean, even the Gates Foundation had, you know, put a whole separate uh, effort into building infrastructure, right? I mean, even in Africa, just administering uh, tuberculosis regimens, right, is not easy. And so I think where we really need to focus our energy and attention, and some people have brought up the idea of drones, you know, uh, the the advent of being able to deliver things, uh, you know, uh, to remote areas more easily, you know, through drone technology as an example. So I think it's marrying what is going to be easier to gather around the world is information on patients that could benefit from an intervention. Um, and then the, the real question is, all right, how do we get those interventions to those, those patients? So, so there's made some great comments there. And, and I think uh, to build on these stories a bit, it's, it's really, I mean, one way to think about this is, we, have, we were already entering and we've if sped up the entry of acceptance of new technological ways to solve certain problems, be they drones or AI or ML or others. At the same time, there's a lot of suspicion that has also gone up amongst the common populace about some of these techniques. And is my data going to be shared? What does it mean if I give up my genetic data? Uh, you know, there's been challenges in COVID of, of different institutions sharing data for various reasons like that. And, and, and some of them are good reasons too. So. I think, you know, we are entering a phase where, as you've said, at Microsoft and at other places, there's a, 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 a sort of design for trust that takes place. But I would posit that the next evolution that needs to take place needs to take place away from the engineering groups into a different group. So, you know, you had industrial, uh, the industrial revolution and industrial engineering that translated later on to industrial design, right? I mean, you've had computer science that then translated to user interaction design with its, uh, and, and I, I would almost arguing, argue that you've got some, a, a new form of engineering that's come up, which is really, I would think of it as, you know, distributed and smart computing, distributed and smart sensing and diagnostics, distributed and smart actuation which is actually could be therapeutics in the case of and 
this raises a lot of suspicion and concerns because everything is distributed and you don't even know where all the decision making elements are coming from. Uh, there's a great opportunity to create a new design paradigm here. And, and as opposed to a new engineering paradigm, uh, it's a chance to start thinking for designers to start thinking about how do we create something in this world very similar to how industrial designers took the new tools that were available and said, we're creating new types of forms and functions and usabilities that never existed before. And, and trust is going to be an integral, integral part of that design paradigm. I mean, and so this is probably what's exciting. The world has opened up. I agree completely with Chris that the plumbing is incomplete still. We need to tighten the, improve the plumbing, augment the plumbing and simultaneously start creating some of these design paradigms to think about. I think that's a great point around the design paradigms and, and enabling non-engineers to be able to create this uh, the solutions and opportunity for that. I would love to hear if anybody has ideas around that or is seeing that um, actually being developed. Um, we definitely see more engineering being done now outside of tech corporations um, by, you know, everything down to mom and pop shops. And uh, we're also seeing more and more adoption of this no code, low code solutions, where it's really easy for whether you are, um, whether you're a doctor or you're potentially mechanic even just to adopt something that you can kind of uh, rearrange together to build a solution that's important for your workflow, for your, for your business, for your industries. Um, which industries do we see really leaning into that and benefiting from that? Are we seeing this as or this already emerging and happening? Yeah, I'll speak up, and I think, and then and I'll talk. They're happening in all industries, frankly, and I think you know there's some people here who are better equipped than me to talk about exactly how it's happening in the healthcare industry, but. There's no question. I mean, healthcare is 1% automated today. There's a lot of opportunity, I would say, for improvement. But I'll, I'll pause here, and there are some people better than, than me to talk about. Well, um, I'll just say, build on what everybody said here. Um, you know, design can be developed anywhere, as long as we keep in mind that there is a uh, social engagement that may happen somewhere in the world. Uh, we understand the privacy and consent and so forth. Uh, but development has to be at the local level because there are cultural differences, there are, um, you know, environmental differences, just as simple as, as transportation and storage, right? So I think that that to me is a really has to be a big focus because anytime, you know, even when we have a biomarker discovery and we develop a diagnostic for a novel, uh, you know, uh, novel marker, um, it's $10,000 per test or $3,000 per test. Well, we know that in India or Africa or even China, it's just not going to be scalable. It's not going to be possible. So I think at the design level, we have to think about those things, that how we're going to scale in all parts of the world. Um, in terms of the, you know, different sort of the technologies being leveraged in what industry, you know, I, I would say that the healthcare life sciences industry um, has started to be more open. You know, we are looking at the convergence of these technologies between the AI, AR, you know, computational models, the in vitro systems and, you know, high throughput screening to, you know, using all these different technologies to really speed up, uh, you know, uh, vaccines to therapeutics to diagnostics. I mean, we saw the example on, on Moderna mRNA. And that was the best example of this. Um, you know, they have very sophisticated computational uh, technologies that they use as part of design of this, uh, this, this vaccine. And so I think those are the things that will continue and scale where engineers and everybody's coming together. And, you know, not, not to, you know, be talking more about the work we're doing, but just to give an example of um, we are working with MIT Lincoln Lab and our device is a massive platform. It's like a, it's a lab at home, basically. And we are miniaturizing mass spectra, you know, electrochemical type of technology, DNA, RNA, each one in its own platform. And we have about 15 different specialties that are subspecialties that are working 
on this project between, you know, engineers of, you know, electronics to microfabrications to hardware, software, um, and, uh, um, uh, you know, um, different types of materials, nanomaterials, uh, chemistry, analytical chemistry, biology, you know, all different disciplines of uh, chemistry and biology. So it's all coming together. It's, it's complex, but that's the only way we can, if we want to have disruptive technology that actually can scale around the world, we will have to bring these disciplines together. Um, you know, we never thought that you actually can have these biomaterials 3D printed. We could have additive manufacturing. We're doing that now. We're doing that part of it, right? So I think this is what is, po these are the possibilities that are happening in the industry. That is really exciting, Pam. Thank you for sharing that. Ara, do you see similar things happening in, uh, in sustainability um, in your sector? In sustainability, the uh, fusion of different types of technologies or moves, or you know, more generally, probably knowledge industry moves slightly in a different direction. I think uh, the key uh, two areas of development, uh, technological development, are uh, obviously predictive analytics, you know, sustainability industry in a way follows the route of, I would say, high frequency trading houses that have a lot of data and that continuously improve their predictive analytics abilities. And the second, no less important direction is natural language understanding and natural language generation in particular. The uh, fusion of these two technologies together produces what I would say in the knowledge industry, in the inside generation industry, is the future for the coming two to five years. Oh, excellent. Thank you. I want to uh, bring us uh, to a uh, close by asking each one of you to uh, talk a little bit about um, your wishes for how the world uh, is to move in the next uh, year or two and what you're looking forward to happening. Uh, Chris, can we start with you? Sure. Uh, I, I was part of a panel a couple weeks ago where there was this concept of a bioforce, right? We have a, a space force now in the United States and Air Force. And the the idea that what we learned from uh, the COVID experience is that we really need to have these various expert disciplines to work in concert together. And, uh, and so if you just think about all of the different expert areas that for the most part, we're working in their lane, on their specific area of expertise. So you, if you think about, you know, the people who develop diagnostics, right? Or if you think about, you know, the sector that develops vaccines, or you think about, you know, the CDC and looking at public health or the epidemiologists or the FDA regulators, right? Or, you know, you think about the drug developers or the vaccine developers, and you think about the, you know, health policy experts. And all of these uh, people, we're trying to do the best they could, but there wasn't a really formal integrated way to bring all of these different experts at the table so they could really discuss these trade-offs and how do we come together to optimize, uh, you know, systematically, right, uh, to address a problem. And I think we need to have more of, you know, we, we don't have a lot of polymaths, right? People who are expert across a number of very uh, areas of discipline. And so I think we need to start to bring those experts together and kind of force those trade-offs to occur with the experts. And, and that's something I hope we will uh, do a better job with, uh, you know, over the next 10 years. That's a great point. All right, do you want to go next? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. I mean, when I think about what I would wish us you know, as a society, as a global society, to uh, be mindful of over the coming couple of years, I'd say I think that uh, COVID and the pandemics have accelerated in a way the uh, uh, the empowerment of some of the um, advanced technologies. You remember there was an old theory developed in MIT about technological momentum, and the core is that the moment technology gains the momentum is the humankind that follows the technology and not vice versa. I would like us to be mindful about every advanced technology taking a momentum, whether it's AI, whether it's machine learning, whatever it is, blockchain, 
which we never mentioned today during the conversation, and make sure that we really uh, know and we really we take account of how technological momentum takes place and we prioritize ethics over anything else when taming the technology. Thank you. Thank you. Pam, would you uh, please um, share your thoughts and your wishes for the next few years? Um, um, I love the name, the Bioforce. <laughs> I, I, I think that that's a great one. Um, so my wish list would be, you know, gl more global cl collaboration. I think COVID really exposed that, that uh, we, we can't be thinking just locally. We, we need to think more. We need to leverage expertise all across. And uh, we need to leverage that data that may be in existence so we can, we can uh, care for people more effectively. But one of the other thing that, you know, sort of lacked in investment in solutions and so forth was more preventive and integrated uh, care. Uh, I think that's where we need to move uh, in order to really have the better clinical outcomes for patients. And in addition to that is the interoperability of different systems. You know, we've got so many disparate systems, they don't talk to each other. And that was very clear, you know, during COVID, uh, not being able to provide that effective care that was possible. So I think that interoperability across different systems uh, would also be very helpful. Thank you so much, uh, Pam. And it's uh, it's actually enlightening to uh, to hear you speak about most importantly thinking across disciplines, thinking across continents and countries and boundaries, thinking about time and uh, um, in terms of health, thinking towards ethical outcomes. Um, in both technology and uh, as, as much as we do in uh, uh, in life sciences. Um, thank you so much for this panel. It was really, uh, really enlightening and really great to see you all. Uh, and thank you for our audience. Thanks, Ida, for moderation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. Bye -bye.